Veterans Memorial Hall, and this is the meeting of the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee. Um, we do have a quorum today, although unfortunately our chair is not present. Um, Barbara Spagnola uh, was traveling and caught an awful bug, and so she's home in bed. But uh, she asked me to chair the meeting, which I'm happy to do. So we do have a quorum, and we will proceed. Um, let me begin with a moment of silence, which we tend to do at some of the other advisory committee meetings, so I will follow that procedure here if that's all right. So we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, do any of the committee members have any announcements today? Dave? No? No. Betty? No. Well, I would like to just uh, remind everyone out there that we are um, still recruiting for two board members for this advisory board. So, uh, Brooke, can you tell us when the final date will be now? I know we've extended the deadline, but... Uh extended, but I'm not sure what the new deadline is okay, yet. Okay, so... We a new notice. Okay. Well, anybody out there who might be interested, please uh, send in your resume to the city clerk. Um, we we want to have seven members, and it's a great opportunity to learn about how your, your city government works. So, uh, please consider it. Uh, I do not see any members of the public, so I will open and close public comment. And we will first uh, ask for approval of the minutes of the April 19th meeting. Um, has everybody had a chance to look them over? And yes. yes. Okay. Uh, you have to use your mic. I forget the mic all the time. Sorry. I move that we approve the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, Betty. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Um, we were expecting today to have Rob Livick here from the Public Works Department, who is going to give us an update on the San Luis Obispo County Council of Governments transportation plan uh, that will be on the ballot in November, hopefully. So uh, we will uh, postpone that presentation until he gets here, but we will move on to progress update on the uh, public friendly budget and we have a subcommittee and both subcommittee members are here so if you would like to just kind of update us and then perhaps we can have a short discussion about it I've collected some examples of um, budget summary documents and actually budget documents uh, adopted budget documents from other cities I went back to the city I used to work for, City of Santa Rosa, because that's who I'm most familiar with, and uh, obtained copies of theirs, and also looked at some different cities that were on par population-wise, staffing-wise, with, uh, with Morro Bay. Uh, Healdsburg was one of them, which is also near Santa Rosa, and the city of Placerville. So I collected those documents and attached them to an email with a few of my own comments and sent them to Ms. Slayton. Uh, I see we have one of the emails forwarded. The other one I sent out yesterday. I don't think that's been forwarded yet. So Those items were printed, and um, I believe that they're available for, um, uh, for distribution to the members. Th this packet is the one that I sent out. I, I sent these attached to an email on Sunday. That was my first email, and the, then the second email I sent yesterday, and that actually had some budget. Yes, I did documents. distribute that. Okay, I, I, I didn't. I didn't see it in the. It should be. Um, I sent it out to the entire committee today. Okay. It went out just a little bit before I forwarded that. Okay, I'll double check. Okay. And uh, did that with the purpose of. Uh, Hopefully the committee members and uh, Council Member Hetty can review them and we can get the conversation started on what form and content of public friendly budget documents would be appropriate for Morro Bay. Okay. Um, I did actually take a look at some of the documents that were forwarded and I thought it was really a great start. Um, 
there's no need to really reinvent the wheel, and I think we have a lot of good ideas from these documents. Um, I would like to maybe talk a little bit, if we could, here, because I know we have a subcommittee, and I know you will be meeting um, shortly, but maybe we could talk about what we would like to see and, and some reactions to what we've had a chance to look at um, in a budget-friendly document. Um, anybody have any comments that they would like to start with? I have been talking to some people, you know, just community people and things like that, and asked them what would they like to see in terms of a document. And everybody says, I don't want to know everything, but I want to know the big things, you know, and what's going on and where the savings plans are and what future strat uh, strategic plans you may have to be added to the budget so that you have a, a better picture. Um, their biggest comment was that they're finally glad to see something that is going to go in the direction of giving them some idea of how the money is spent and where the majority of the money comes from because they get the impression that all the money is coming from property taxes, which may be, but we have so many other things going on too and about the savings for the sewer plant, et cetera. But uh, the problem is they don't want it to be too big and they don't want it to be small, too small. Does that sound like a fairy tale to have it just right? But anyway, that's what they've been talking about. And a lot of these things, I don't know how they were presented in the, these documents that we're getting samples of where, you know, how they were presented. So it'd be nice to know how they were presented in the, when they were originally were given out. Any thoughts? These, the, the, uh, the budget summary, there, there's basically, from what I could find on the web, there were two types of documents. There's a budget summary, and then there's the budget itself. Some of the longer budget documents, like the adopted budget that City of Morro Bay publishes and puts on the web, some of those actually had a budget summary built into them at, to start with. Right. So as you're looking through it, instead of looking at tables of long tables of numbers from multiple fiscal years, you're, you're, they're, using, they're, they're using pie charts and bar charts and simple, easy to read tables to explain what, where the sources of revenue are, how the money is, is allocated to the various departments. Uh, capital improvement projects are covered in some of these to some degree. They vary in length from two pages. Uh, one that I was impressed with was the city of Gilroy. They have a budget summary document that's 13 pages long and it has a lot of information in it. And it's really tailored towards the citizens more than it is the council or the staff. So right. they obviously put a lot of time and effort into that. Uh, Walnut Creek, we've seen that that example before the, uh, the their budget story, very detailed, uh, a lot of production work going into that. Um, so so it's it it, it ranges um, as far as what we put into our doc our our document. If we're going to do a budget summary document, then that's in my mind that's the question. What is what the three questions are? What what are the form? What's the form of the document going to be? What's the content going to be? And how is it going to be presented to the public? So uh, that's what is yet to be determined, obviously. So we right. need to talk about that. Yeah, I might add to that. Um, you have to really identify who the audience is. And there may very well be different documents for different audiences. So you might have a very brief summary for the general public, just giving what they need, and then maybe something a little bit more in detail for sort of the opinion leaders who pay closer attention, and then obviously you have the whole document, the, the entire budget. But uh, did you have, want to add anything, Russ? I was going to say that uh, at our last meeting, uh, Dave and I basically talked about having a, a one or two page. Uh, it went out with the utility bills in Santa Rosa. Just a yeah, I, su I had previously suggested a, a two-page document that could be sent out as a utility bill insert as an example. That's something to be able to get it out into the 
yeah. citizenry's hands. Mm -hmm. Inexpensively, too, Inex we might. Yeah. Inexpensively, right. and pretty much every resident residence in Morro Bay gets a utility bill, so they're right. all going to get it. Whether they read it or not is another question, but they're going to, they would get it that way. Right. And uh, also, and we also talked about, uh, in addition to opinion leaders, um, most of the uh, city's officials would likely be interested, not necessarily in seeing the whole budget, but in just getting a slightly toothier um, idea of what was going on rather than just the two-page mailer. Um, and then, of course, uh, the whole budget with the uh, budget in brief that we used to have reinstituted and, and uh, appended to budget documents in the future. Okay. Um, I would add just one th Wait, Susan, did you have something you wanted to say? I wanted to let you know that I had spoken with the city manager and mentioned to him about adding some graphs into the budget, and he said he's going to incorporate those in his budget letter this year and see how that looks. Oh, very good. Um, the one thing that I wanted to just add to this discussion, and then maybe we can just follow up with how, well, how we're going to proceed um, on this issue is I was in looking at what you provided us, I really liked San Luis Obispo, the city, for putting in the goals, the city goals, as a part of the budget document and actually showing how much money was being uh, allocated to achieve each of those goals. So I thought that was a very helpful and useful um, addition, in addition to where the money comes from and how it's spent. Yeah, and getting back to this distribution and how we see it, are we thinking also of just doing it one time? Because I think sometimes when we get something and we only see it one time, we never remember it again. And I think we need to see how we would do a follow-up of the budget information. Because I know we, in fact, I think it was my colleague here that mentioned that we should probably have the budget at every meeting a little thing to tell you budget in brief for this month we're talking about such and such you know so that we keep it ongoing because I think a lot of people like the ideas and they look really good but if they don't get the you know the um, push every time to look at it or to think about it they're going to forget it and then when something happens they say oh where did that come from well one of the things that happened with the um, with the graphs and the budget and brief was we, I kind of introduced it at a time of change when we had a, a city manager departing, interim city manager, new city manager, and so now we're trying to resurrect some of that. But we did, we only had the graphs in there for one year and then the next year things just kind of changed. So I'm hoping because um, the new city manager is very interested in developing a document that does appeal to the public. The ideas that come from the committee will be something he'll be very interested in. Okay. Uh, we at one time talked about having a workshop which would allow us to have a working session because one of the challenges for this group is that because of its size, we can't really meet together and get our hands dirty and really start... Uh, you know, getting into the details of it and looking at alternatives and talking about it. So is that a possibility, Susan, that we could do? Uh, and if so, do you know when would be a good time for that? I had suggested possibly July. Okay. Only because um, June is such a busy month with the budget, wrap-up, end-of-year wrap-up. July would be great. And any time that you want to do it that the committee can find a time they're available, I'll find you a room where you can meet and... Okay, and we can get some kind of public notice out. Yes. Okay, well, let's plan that. <laughs> I, I think uh, I know that Barbara uh, has also expressed an interest in doing that, and it would allow us to really get into it, I think, in m more than we can do in a meeting like this, so that'd be great. Good. Uh, well, then, uh, we will... And you two will continue meeting... Oh, yes. And you now yes. have some input from the rest of us. So um, we will look forward to having a, a, a public workshop on it. Thank you. And I see Mr. Livick is here. And so we will move now to item B1, which is to get a report 
on the San Luis Obispo Council of Government's transportation plan, which uh, I know that Barb Spagnola had seen a presentation of it, and I also did uh, with the Public Works Advisory Board. So uh, it's coming up, and it's of interest to people. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, committee members um, didn't get the electronics uh, going, so we don't won't have it on the screen, but I'll give you an overview of the um, the uh, San Luis Obispo Council government's um, what we're calling self-help county status. So this was a presentation that uh, uh, Slocog made to both the city council and the Public Works Advisory Board um, uh, last month, and um, it is regarding becoming um, another one of the counties in California that has a local sales tax initiative dedicated to transportation. Um, most of the highway funds um, in this state come from the gas tax and consumption of gasoline has gone down over the years um, um, and um, the tax collected has also gone down. Um, there are more fuel efficient cars on the road um, and the the total number of gallons consumed peaked in 2004, 2005, and it's been decreasing, decreasing ever since. The federal gas tax is fixed at 18.4 cents per gallon, um, uh, while the state gas tax is adjusted every July 1st, um, and um, it was growing up until 2012 and it has declined in 2014 and 2015 um, from 36 cents a gallon down to 30 cents a gallon. Um, and the gas tax supports a lot more things than just um, highways, um, local streets and roads, highway safety, maintenance, rehabilitation. Um, one of the newest, uh, biggest bites you, um, from, that's taking a bite out of the sales tax is the payback on the state transportation bond, um, uh, the debt from 2006, and that's um, about $1 billion every year that goes to that. Um, like we said, the funding is in steep decline. There's no legislative fix in sight. There doesn't seem to be agreement in the legislature or the governor's office. Um, we are not competitive. This county, this city, um, is not competitive as state level for grant funds because those other self-help counties bring um, their local money to the table and they score better. Um, and we've lobbied hard with the um, in Sacramento and got got really gotten nowhere. Um, 20 counties in California, 81% of California's population are known as self-help counties. And 15 counties this year are investigating to be um, self-help counties. Um, the self-help counties in those 20, uh, those 20 counties invest $4.5 billion in transportation funding compared to the $1 billion that the state provides to those same, same counties. So self-help for San Luis Obispo County, um, local funds for local priorities. Um, the state can't raid those funds. Um, looking at a half cent um, sales tax, which would raise $25 million per year countywide. Half the revenues would be paid by um, tourists and vis visitors. It would help us leverage and be competitive for state and um, federal funding. Um, it's going to be will be transparent and have a guaranteed expenditure plan. There are safeguards, and it will help to expedite project delivery. The um, Slocog staff. Um, did uh, a bunch of uh, public engagement outreach and um, focus group sessions. And what their findings showed was uh, local streets and road repair 
um, were a prior priority along with bike and pedestrian projects that connect communities and then also an increase in transit services for seniors and persons with um, disabilities and then point-to-point -point services. Based on those priorities, um, the SLOCOG board, um, which is made up of the County Board of Supervisors and a representative from each city, um, approved an expenditure plan. Um, the term of the sales tax would be, is uh, uh, proposed to be nine years, so a total of $22.5 million would be raised in those nine years um, countywide. Um, 56 um, million would be going to regional projects. Um, the regional project in um, the North Coast would be improvements to the 41 Highway 1 Main Street um, intersection there. Um, $33.8 million countywide would be going to bike and pedestrian projects. The North Coast example of that would be the Morro Bay to Cayucas connector. Um, $22.5 million would be um, spent on public transportation. And then 50% of the funds, or $112.5 million, would be divided amongst the, the county and the city um, for their own local choice, um, basically for local streets and roads. The um, administrative costs are set, set by um, state law at a maximum of 1%. Um, other safeguards include that development would have to pay its fair share. Um, there has to be a maintenance of effort um, with this uh, proposal. So this cannot supplant um, existing funding for local streets and roads. It has to supplement. So you can't, if you get uh, a million dollars in a year in um, through this initiative, you can't take a million dollars out of your streets and road funding to spend on something else. Um, it'll require um, annual audits and annual reporting, and then we'll have a independent uh, taxpayer oversight taxpayer oversight committee. Um, just like our own, this committee does uh, with our Measure Q, Q. And the proposal is for a representative from each city, plus the county, plus um, um, a few of the interest groups. I think the SLOCOG board is still working out the details on um, the makeup of that. Um, other projects, regional projects they're looking at um, countywide is um, congestion relief on Highway 101. <coughs> in the um, Shell Beach Straits area, um, between Shell Beach and Pismo, um, South County congestion relief, and um, Highway 101 and 46 for the North County. Um, in public transportation, um, there's the 10% is, <coughs> excuse me, 7% um, it would be going to transit, 2% for seniors, veterans, and people, uh, persons with disabilities, and then 1% would be going to um, uh, transportation demand management strategies. Something like our call -a ride system, where um, a point-to-point -point system. The 50% um, local road repair um, is proposed to have a set aside of 10% for community enhancements and 4% for safe, safe routes to schools. So this community enhancements projects would be something like um, um, our proposed um, Embarcadero to um, downtown connector project. Safe routes to schools um, would be our um, um, ever unsuccessful application, um, the Greenwood um, pedestrian and corridor pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Um, um, one of the reasons that we're have been unsuccessful in the past is this all, this pot that Safe Routes to cool, Schools comes out of is alternative transportation, and we're compared against um, cities that have um, safety pro real safety problems. Um, 
um, many more accidents and um, injuries and fatalities than, thank goodness, Morro Bay has. So what does this mean for Morro Bay? Um, it means an additional 573,668. I don't know if I would have reported it to that level of accuracy because it is based <laughs> on um, sales and sales tax. So I would say about a, a $570,000 a year between 570, $570 and 575 um, increase in our local street funds or $5.1 million um, over the next nine years. And that is, in addition to that, will be the regional projects which um, they are specified in the initiative, so um, the 41 main will be hard-coded into the initiative. Um, and like I said, other projects could be um, the downtown Embarcadero connection and um, um, street and road maintenance, of course, um, harbor walk, walk extension, um, and the uh, Morro Bay Cayucas Trail. The next steps, some of them have already taken place. Um, there was a um, slow cog board meeting um, on May 4th to move this project further along, which um, the slow cog board did approve on a um, 10 to one and one absentee vote. Um, June the 1st, slow cog um, board would, will approve the plan to send out to jurisdictions for our final approval. So. Um, they're looking for all of the jurisdictions to approve this project plan. Um, June, July the 13th, um, it will go back to the Slowcog Board uh, to adopt the plan and ordinance and call for the election. And July 19th, um, the County Board of Supervisors um, would place it on the November um, 16 ballot. And I was just looking at a, a recent email from the executive director, Ron DeCarly, that gave us a status update. Um, the uh, proposal at the Slowcog board remained intact. Um, nine year term, um, one half cent sales tax, uh, $25 million per year, and the formula um, um, generally unchanged. They are making some tweaks to the transit formula that we'll see uh, come out and um, some of the jurisdictions did not like the set aside um, in the local share for uh, community, the required set aside for community enhancements and for safe routes to schools. They wanted to have um, more flexibility to use that money. So uh, when they bring that back, we'll see what um, comes of that. That concludes my um, presentation, and I'll try to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Levick. Uh Any questions? Dave, go ahead. Is this a general sales tax measure that uh, requires uh, like a 50% or 55% majority to get it approved? It's a dedicated sales tax measure, so it requires two-thirds um, majority vote. Um, the polling indicated um, they were just under two-thirds with a 20-year um, plan and over two-thirds with less than a 20-year plan. The consultant that Slowcog uses recommended a nine-year plan to get us started and to show that we could succeed with this uh, program. The problem with the nine-year tax initiative, it's not bondable. So larger projects cannot be accomplished with a shorter term period because it's um, uh, nobody, no one will issue bonds for a nine year uh, tax. The uh, $570,000 a year that could come to Morro Bay, uh, is that for capital improvement projects only or is that some, can that be used for maintenance? It's completely discretionary for the city. So it could be used for um, all capital, could be used for all maintenance, um, or a little bit of both. So as we move, as this 
moves forward, and I'm assuming that we won't know for this budget year. Well, I know we won't know because it's November. Um, next budget year, we'll roll this out through our the the Street Summit program, where we pick which projects we spend our um, uh, allocation of Measure Q money on, and that'll be coming to our Public Works Advisory Board next month. Is the uh, is the Highway 41? Interchange part of that five hundred and seventy thousand. No, that's an addition to the five hundred seventy four thousand. Okay. That's part of the regional um, projects pot of money. Okay. Um, currently, Measure Q is bringing in about five hundred thousand dollars a year. Rough, roughly, roughly, yeah, five hundred thousand dollars a year. This would add another five hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year. Uh, is that are those two going to be the only source of funds for Morro Bay to improve its streets, or are there other funding sources for to be able to do for that? major maintenance and capital for routine maintenance? We use money from you know our gas uh, gas tax subvention um, for you know the. Uh, 25 tons of asphalt that we, or 40 tons of asphalt that we buy a year, painting, paying, paying our streets uh, worker salary, um, that sort of thing. Approximately how much is that pot of money? $220,000 ish. Okay, so we're looking at the potential of getting a million to a million three for this nine year period. For street maintenance and improvements and whatnot, and um, an indication of if there's a, um, a pavement condition index, basically zero through a hundred, um, seventy is kind of average streets. If our we're at uh, the high fifties, low sixties. Once you drop below the low 50s, it drops really fast. Things start to fall apart quickly. Once you, it's a um, uh, the curve is flat on the top, then goes vertical, and then flattens out. Once it turns to dirt, you know, it doesn't degrade very much more any, after that. But um, as long as you can keep it up before it gets real steep, you're spending less money on it than you do when that you're in the steep part of the degradation curve. If we, our streets were all at 70, um, based on um, our uh, modeling efforts, it would cost about $1.4 million to keep our streets at an average of 70. That's per year? Per year. Yes. For our, we have uh, 53 and a half center line miles of streets in the city of Morro Bay. So would this, in your view, would this sales tax measure this transportation plan be sufficient for Morro Bay's, need, Morro Bay's needs, or should Morro Bay also consider in addition to that an additional tax measure of some sort to supplement the street funding? We need additional revenue for street funding. Um, I don't know whether that's through a tax measure or um, in way, other ways that we're looking at to increase general fund revenues. Um, so um, to like I said, need about $1.4 million a year in, well, this was in 2015 dollars, um, to maintain our streets at a 70. Um, we're at, we're below 70. So obviously somewhere around a million dollars isn't sufficient, but you, you will see market improvement um, in our streets given that uh, um, we won't be dropping as fast uh, as, uh, um, with the street conditions. And I think you mentioned that state grant funding is pretty much out of the question for Morro Bay as far as... Um, and grant funding is early, late 1990s, early 2000 was when it dried up for uh, maintenance type projects. I haven't seen, it's mainly used on large, now it's being spent on interchanges. Um, that's where all the money's going to, um, you know, the uh, Los Angeles Valley Road interchange. We'll see some um, uh, federal grant money um, set aside has been set aside for our uh, 41 Highway One project. Some um, congest congestion relief um, money um, has been set aside for that. So. Um, that's really where the grant money is going. There is no state maintenance money um, anymore. 
Are there any projections on where the gas tax is going, the direction they get, or how much how much it may fall in the future? I, you know, you're seeing a lot of there, there's there's all kinds of things taking place in the in the marketplace as far as ride sharing that could reduce gas tax. Vehicle ownership seems to be leveling off. So I would think that gas tax could be declining in the, and, and fuel mileage increases, federally mandated fuel mileage increases. Yeah, I, reducing I, that. So is there any projections as far as where that's going? I don't know what the numbers are, but I would say it's going down. Um, there's a pilot program going on right now where they're trying to, uh, instead of looking at um, gas on the, vo or tax on the volume of gas, looking at a tax on vehicle mile traveled. Um, because that's more an indicator of where on the on the California's road system is the amount of miles that gets put on them rather than the amount of fuel that gets purchased. And that captures the high mileage, the electric vehicles also. Are there any prospects for federal grant money? Of course, I, I imagine the federal grant money is funneled through the states. Is that how it typically, typically works? Typically, typically. Um, uh, the Congress seems to have a difficulty in passing transportation measures. Uh, uh, the Transportation Trust Fund seems like every year is just about to go bankrupt before they um, pass a emergency measure to um, backfill that. So I don't really s see any um, um, huge pots of money coming from the federal government either. The, the Congress recently did pass a high, uh, transport, highway transportation bill, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. Um, they, I don't think they fully funded the, uh, it, though. Um, and we have a bunch of projects in it, but they um, haven't figured out how they're going to fund all those projects. So that's not a reliable. That's that's not a reliable process. No, as far as and it's so. really these days is dedicated for um, larger infrastructure projects um, that we just don't have here on the north coast. Good and bad. We don't have the traffic. Uh, that's good. Yeah. The road condition not so good. Yeah, exactly. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thanks. Betty, we know that this is all if, you know, if we get this passed. And, but I know now that you're working on things. So if this was to pass, would you be able to start right away with some ideas and know where you want to put the smart money so that you can get the best bang for your buck? Or how do you approach that if? So um, we use a, a model to determine which streets should be and what tr treatment technique should be used on each street. And it's the, th the um, theory behind the model is pavement preservation. So nobody likes to hear this when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's best to keep the best streets good rather than throwing a lot of money at the streets that have already kind of gone bad. So um, keep the best streets good. Um, do safety um, repairs on the streets, so pothole patching, but no slurring, no triple layer cape seal, no thin overlays on those streets that are pretty bad um, until they've gone completely bad. And then you've gotten all the value that you can out of them, and it makes sense to reconstruct them um, at that point in time. Most cities, the, the city engineer will say that, uh, but the money doesn't use, typically get spent that way. It's usually maybe three quarters of the money is spent towards pavement preservation with a quarter of it going to try to help those worst streets. Um, from a purely engineering standpoint, it doesn't make sense, but rarely do I do things purely on engineering. Um, and also because you know, I have the uh, fabulous fine store on Morro Bay Boulevard, and I've been seeing more and more big trucks coming down Morro Bay Boulevard. And I was wondering, do we have, um, you know, set rules about these trucks and how much they travel, and do we know how many? Because it seems like a lot. The windows shake, so you know, there's a, quite a few coming down those streets. And I know we need delivery, and it can't all be airlifted, but I was just wondering about the trucks. So um, uh, 
truck traffic is really what wears out mm. uh, streets. Um, and that's what you design for, is that number of axle loads um, that are um, based on the estimated amount of truck traffic that will be there. So if we were starting from scratch now and designing all of our streets, it wouldn't matter that there was a bunch of big trucks going down there because we would have assumed that and assumed a 50-year life for, for the streets and designed that into it. Um, <clears throat> The problem is now, when many of the streets were designed in Morro Bay, um, those techniques were out there, um, but especially in the north end of town, they chose not to um, pave. M luckily, downtown and the south end of town, um, the underlying soil is very sandy and it's very forgiving for um, street construction. That's why you see the condition of the streets in the south end much better. It's not that they're that much better construction, just constructed, it's the underlying soil material is, is a better base for the streets. And so yes, truck traffic does cause problems, but a modern designed um, pavement section should withstand the, that, that traffic load. Moore Bay Boulevard does currently have a modern um, pavement section in it. Uh, uh, four years ago, we did a recon reconstruct, grind and reconstruction project on Moore Bay Boulevard, so it has sufficient asphalt depth um, there to withstand that traffic. And then my other question is on some of these places that have, like you said, just dirt and you're not doing much to maintain them. Is there any provision where these homeowners, to protect their property there, they could have an, a nonprofit, or do they ever do that in a city where they could have a certain area that would be maintained by the homeowners themselves? Um, typically, um, due to liabilities with street pavement, people get hurt uh, right. lifting heavy things. And if they're working on public streets, um, the city could also be liable. So typically you don't do a volunteer street paving program. Um, our, we do still do um, safety related repairs and um, pothole patching, um, skin patching on those streets that have gone bad. We have to maintain that because many of our streets are also our walking surfaces. So um, we can't have the asphalt piled up in, in the street. So use the, um, if people are listening out there and they have a, their favorite pothole, use the service request on our webpage or use the My Moro Bay app, snap a picture of it. Um, it gets in our queue and our um, Matt Bishop, our new streets uh, supervisor, will have his crews out there in probably a matter of days or maybe a week um, and be patching potholes. Well, I wasn't thinking that they would be doing it themselves, but they would have an association that collected money and then would get that hired to do, whether they do it through the city by paying you know, somebody to come out and do that through the city or something like that. Because first of all, I don't know if they really want to do it and how much it would take or anything like that. But short of making the street private, that's what I was thinking. So some communities in this county have done that. Cambria has special assessments on some streets where um, um, they will assess the, the, it's a voluntary a little assessment district. They come in and uh, form that. And uh, um, I, I used to work for the county and that was one of my programs uh, doing these special assessments. And um, it was real hit, hit and miss which streets mm -hmm. did. But it is, it is in the realm of possibilities oh. to do. Rascal. The, uh, remind me again, the uh, 570000 a year, that's including um, state funding, which we would become competitive for if this was passed or not? The 573000 would just be the, um, the additional sales tax money. Okay. Um, that would help us leverage additional state funding. So we could use a portion of that, let's say, to match a grant. Um, if you can provide a local match, you have skin in the game, you look better on those grant applications. 
my question is, could uh, the could the increased, pardon me, could the increased uh, state funding um, bring us up to that uh, 1.4 million a year number that we that uh, that we need for street maintenance? Highly unlikely. The the state money probably will not never be used for maintenance again. Okay. I would say it'd be used for more of capital projects and um, capacity um, improvements. That was it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just follow up on Betty's idea here. Um, is this something that we could add to the street summit as at least mentioning as a possibility for some of the streets that are in such terrible repair, especially if the citizens were willing to contribute some money and maybe the city would give a match so that we could deal with some of those bad streets? Is that a possibility? I can, I can resurrect my notes on that and uh, bring that forward with, at the street summit as a, as a way. Um, generally, it's not very popular. Um, well, and, I'm sure. Yeah. But... <laughs> but um, I, you know, uh, this committee has also looked at, pos at ways to try to get our streets in better repair. And it is an issue that the citizens are dealing with and faced with. And we know that we're not meeting need. And it would be really nice if at least we could get up to the $1.4 million a year uh, in revenue. Uh, whether it's finding some money in the uh, general fund, um, any any extra money that we take in that we haven't committed uh, to create a fund for streets specifically so that the citizens can see it's a priority that we really are trying. Um, that was, that's my little take on it. Um, I've been harping about streets now for a long time <laughs> and have become known as the street lady, but not lady <laughs> of the streets, but the street lady. And so I use every opportunity to do that. Um, the only other question I had about this is uh, if you are familiar at all with how they intend to do the, run this campaign with the citizens, uh, the sales tax campaign, because Measure D was so successful and they really worked hard at it. Um, and I'm just wondering if you know what's local. No, I, I don't know the details of the campaign. And it, at some point in time, um, it has to be taken over by private side, and we can't really um, play anymore as government officials. So oh, I see. I, they're working with uh, chambers of commerces um, um, and citizens groups. Um, um, I know that Stephanie and Ron have been meeting throughout the county with those groups. Okay. Um, and would you remind everybody again, since we're talking about streets, uh, about the Public Works Advisory Board meeting uh, that will be in June, so it's coming up very soon, and it is an opportunity for the citizens to come out and talk about their street issues. Yeah, so we'll be looking at um, um, the street, street paving program for the next fiscal year, fiscal year, and we typically do that at what we call the Street Summit. So we'll identify... Um, um, our proposed slate of, of projects. Um, we don't have the final listing of streets until the budget gets approved, of course, and uh, later on, but we'll, we'll be pretty close by that point. So we'll have maps that show uh, what streets we have worked on in the past few years and what streets we're proposing to work on um, over this next um, uh, budget cycle. Okay, and that is the 15th of June. Yes, it is. At 530, 5.30, this building, right. uh, Vets Hall, um, and we'll have our um, full Public Works Engineering staff here to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Marla, may I ask a real quick oh, question? Oh, sure. Of course. So the information that you provided, is it available somewhere that the committee could look at? What you just had... I'll have to get you the email link to that because I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to email you the link to that. I believe it's on the Slowcogs website, but uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember what 
the, I think if you go to slowcog.org, you'll be able to find this presentation there. But I'll email you with the exact URL to get you to that point. Yeah, it might also be on the on the PWAB um, agenda since it was part of the staff. It was part of the report. Yes. Yes. So it is. If you go to meetings and the PWAB agenda and look at the staff report, it should be there. I did have one other question. Go ahead, the, Dave. The uh, the presentation that Slowcog did to the PWAB and City Council is that on YouTube? Yes, it is. Okay, where where would I find it? Is it was it a PWAB meeting? Or it was a council? PWAB meeting and a city council meeting. Um, so if you just Google, go to YouTube, um, the city's YouTube website, and um, um, okay, Brooke will send out a link to that. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> We really appreciate it. It was very helpful. Uh, You're welcome. As, as I said, we have, we have looked at how to fund street repairs, so it's helpful to know what's going on. Okay, we will move on to, um, I think Susan is going to tell us about the notification of the upcoming City Council budget session. And I, we're going to also get the final audit presentation at that time. Is that correct? Yes. So at the 24th, at the May 24th meeting, we're going to have a budget study session that's going to start at 3.30 here in Betts Hall. We are additionally at the um, regular council meeting. The auditor will be here. So if you arrive early, I'm sure that you can corral him and ask him some of your particular interest questions that you might like him to address in um, his presentation. And then we have a second buddy budget session, if needed, and that's going to be on May 31st, um, again, here in Betts Hall at 4 o'clock. Okay. And will there be documents available ahead of time for these meetings? A staff report and... There will be a staff report. I believe the, the city manager right now is finishing up his budget letter and we will get the budget, the draft budget out for council. So we've got kind of a little deadline going on where we need to get that to them sooner than later. Right. Okay. And will this committee um, see that budget as an, an item on our agenda at all, or will it go directly to city council? It's going to go directly to city council. Okay. Because I noticed it was on our work plan, but... Yeah, it, unfortunately, with the timing of the committee meeting and the timing of delivery of the draft budget to the... Um, to the council, it, it's not possible okay. for us to give it to you the draft document that I had that I gave to the city manager this weekend, he has put two or three little tweaks already in that. So it's just, I, I, don't, I don't see how we're going to do that and get it to the committee beforehand right. Right. unless we were to delay the, um, the first budget study session for the council and push that into June because you just don't have your numbers. I got my um, risk management numbers on Friday, and that's, that's a lot of money. That's a million dollars in one invoice. So that's something that I need to get a little bit earlier. I can get some pretty good estimates, but the invoice didn't actually come through in email. Either It was either Friday or Monday. I don't remember which. Mm -hmm. So it makes it difficult. So if we were to have any kind of a, a we should really come to this meeting and be present and, yes. and speak. Yes. If we have comments. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and future agenda items, do you have something for us in the future, Susan? I don't. We'll just have the standard minutes and then the um, update from the committee on the budget-friendly document. So it's anything else that the committee may want to bring forward. Okay. I was thinking about we, last meeting we were talking about contracts and we were talking about the legal contracts and how many there was and everything. And I meant to ask, it came in my dream at 2 o'clock in the morning, is <laughs> which, which ones of those contracts are, how would they determine that they were most likely need a lawyer or uh, expertise or could there be something that a paralegal could have done or something like that? 
Was there any breakdown of those types of things? Because re you remember that there were situations, you said, between cities that you really felt that they had to have a legal expert on that, but maybe not some of the others because there was a, so many. We do have quite a few. It's um, Sometimes it's, it's a you need another attorney because our city attorney's office is working on this particular item and needs we need as city we need consultation on that that because the city audit firm is working on it they can't provide so we have to go to an outside attorney and get guidance um, generally speaking i would say that we would have very little that a paralegal could pick up and do the majority of the items when we go when we find an attorney we're looking at water rights we're looking at employment issues and we're looking at, um, of course, just general, you know, general, general qu legal questions. I don't think that we, I don't, I don't really know items. I don't know that there's ever been any kind of a study done to see if there were items that could go to a paralegal as opposed to an attorney. I know our attorney office does utilize staff that are not attorneys. And in one in particular that I just worked with recently had to do with a um, official statement language. And the person that worked with me on that was more of a finance person as opposed to a um, just, you know, an, an attorney. And he helped me. His, of course, their rates are lower. So our, our attorney firm does have a good mix of other people, and they do bring those other people in if they can yeah, I was just wondering because we were talking about how to save money and we talked about contracts sometimes save us some money, but maybe they don't in the long run. So we were talking about that. And I think uh, our chairperson had questioned whether we sold the land over by for the fire station and the cloisters. And at that time you said you hadn't heard. And I was wondering if that land has ever been sold. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no other further comments or questions, uh, the meeting will be adjourned, and our next meeting will be Tuesday, June 21st at 3.30 in this building. Thank you.